everyone. So my name is Shirley, and tonight I am going to talk to you guys about D3JS and Backbone.js. So when I was first thinking about what to talk about, I uh, was uh, really a great loss, because I haven't been coding for that long, and I haven't really been using D3 for that long. So what can I talk to you guys about that you don't already know? And then it occurred to me as I was going through this thought process that perhaps what I need to be talking about isn't necessarily any sort of wisdom or insight that I have for you, but rather the experiences I've had trying to combine D3 and Backbone together. And the way that I did them, the approaches I took, where I was successful, where I was extremely, extremely not successful, what I've learned and what I didn't learn. <laughs> So it all started when I uh, was given an assignment at work to create a visual editor um, with Backbone for structure and D3 for visualizations. So Backbone is an MVC library that gives structure to your applications and helps you manage data. And some of the basic components of Backbone is the collection, the model, and the view. And so the collection helps manage the models, and the models manage the data, and the views manage the DOM elements and the user interactions. And one of my favorite things about um, Backbone is that you can have, or they have built-in event handlers for say when um, a model is added to a collection or removed from a collection or a data attribute is changed on a model. D3 on the other hand is a library that helps visualize complex data with SVG, and one of the most common patterns is the whole select the data, or select the elements, find the data, enter it, update it, and exit it. And as, as I started working on this project, <laughs> I started to realize that I had no idea, while these were two really great libraries, really powerful libraries, how to put them together well and effectively. And so the first thing I tried to do was something completely simple and naive. And it was to inject the D3 into Backbone. Because with the Backbone view, what you can do is, upon instantiation, it's going to create a div element, or any element that you specify. And then you can append it to, a doc uh, append it to the document. And so what I tried to do was create a circle element from a Backbone view, and then append it to SVG. And this did not work out well for me. And I couldn't figure out for hours why it wasn't working for me. <laughs> and But once we started to Google, it turns out it's a namespacing issue. And when you have multiple dialects within, or multiple XML dialects within your document, your tag names might start to be the same and start to collide. So to keep that from happening, we have to namespace our dialects. Um, and what happens with Backbone is once you instantiate something with Backbone, it automatically namespaces it to HTML. So when I tried to do something really naive like this, where I tried to sp like set the namespace onto the element and make it into an SVG namespace, it really did not work. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so my coworker came out with a solution that was really good and I really liked, which was to create the SVG element, the circle element, with D3 first. Because what D3 does is um, when you try to append something, it not only appends it, but it first creates it and namespaces it to SVG. And then you can pass that element into Backbone upon instantiation, and then the view has a reference not only to the circle element, but if you decide to wrap it within D3, you have that for convenience also. And so I was really, really happy, and I was really excited because I got something to work, and, and you know that's, that's kind of cool. Um, but then I went to a Bay Area D3 meetup. <laughs> <laughs> And then I realized that there's a whole new world out there and a bunch of different approaches that I could be taking that's completely different from my own. And the particular talk that evening was about D3JS and, um, and uh, MVSTAR frameworks. And uh, Miles was one of the presenters there. And the two main things that I got out of that talk was about reusable charts and 
separation of content and presentation, two things that I was not doing at all with my previous project. And so with these new things I learned, I decided that I wanted to give them a try. So the next project I tried to do, I tried to create uh, reusable components, not, not reusable chart, the whole charts, but rather to go from something very, very simple, something very small, um, like the, the rectangle um, component you might see in those bar graph or the circles or the arrows. Um, and I did this for, a, uh, for the uh, jQuery conference in Portland this past uh, May. Um, and the great thing about this project was that it was, one, had very, very simple charts. So I didn't need to be confused about um, how D3 getting really complex with the charts and the axes. Um, and the second thing was that we were trying to do a living infographic, which meant that the data was updating on a fixed time interval. And we had a very interesting challenge of figuring out who should be handling that, if it was Backbone that should be handling it, or D3 that should be handling it with transitions. In the end, we decided that uh, D3 should have the minimal responsibilities. And what I ended up doing was um, creating a reusable component that, did, that uh, had getters and setters on the Oh, it doesn't scroll. OK. It's below there, there's getters and setters on the side attributes. <laughs> um, and oh, wait, sorry. There we go. Um, and, then, and then it will also render. And, and that's, that's all it did. And from the backbone view, you can create it. You can pass in configuration options, pass in handlers, um, and then append it to whatever parent element you like to. So the breakdown of responsibilities came down to this, that the D3 would render the circle, the rectangle, and the arrow components. Um, it would take in, um, it would have getters and setters for the configuration, and, um, but it would not bind any data. No data was passed in. Instead, Backbone would process the data. Backbone would then take that processed data and then um, set it onto the component as part of its configurations. Um, and when the data was changed, instead of, say, using um, D3 transitions, what we did was we wiped out all of the uh, components and re-rendered them. And so there was a lot of things I really liked about this project and what I learned from it. And one of the things was that I really liked the abstraction. And the fact that the abstraction allowed me to potentially very easily swap in and out different visualization and MVC libraries. And they also provided for a lot cleaner and more readable code. <laughs> and while there were things that I liked, um, I, was, I realized also that um, I wasn't really taking advantage of D3 functionalities, like being able to bind data to the DOM. Um, being able to transition um, those elements between, uh, being able to transition them, and instead I was handling it all from Backbone. So by keeping those in mind, I decided to um, do another project. <laughs> um, and this time, instead of reusable components, I decided to try and do reusable charts um, to give, uh, to try and do the transitions from D3. Um, and the project I chose is uh, Rage Cage. And I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with this, but uh, Rage Cage is a drinking game. Um, and uh, there's, a, it, there's, there's basically two ping pong balls, and there's a bunch of cups in the middle of the table, and there's beer filled in those cups. And then um, you're supposed to you know, like bounce a ping pong ball into it and then pass it around. And then if someone's too slow, you stack the person left to you. And then so if you're not good, there starts to be a lot of drinking. And um, it starts to get really intense. And my friends and I are kind of really competitive. So it starts, there starts to be a lot of yelling. And there starts to be um, a lot of drinking on the players that aren't as good. Um, and a lot of cuss words going around the table. And we found that some of our friends are not a fan of this. Um, so we decided one night to turn it into a spectator sport. Um, and we started taking bets. <laughs> um, so the players that, or the friends that weren't playing um, would bet on the, the friends that were playing. 
um, and they were betting on who they thought would lose. Um, and, and, and then um, because we had a really awesome bookie, she started to write down how much each person was drinking. And then I saw the data and got really excited and decided that it was an opportunity for visualization and an opportunity to try and create reusable charts. Um, so I decided to make, uh, and embarked on this journey to make this application um, to visualize stats for each of the, the games and also potentially in the future allow for um, input for new games. And while I was very excited about this whole thing, um, I soon got really stuck again. And the reason was that I couldn't figure out what should be doing what. Um, so if I needed, so if my backbone view was to pass in um, data and then to have it render um, our chart with D3, would that chart then, you know, like render its child components and pass it back to Backbone for, for reference? Or, and then it got really com complicated, but essentially I couldn't figure out what should the Backbone view be doing? What should the D3, D3 be doing? And where should I be managing all of this data? And then I had a really good talk with Ian, one of the organizers of um, the Bay Area D uh, D3 meetup group. Um, and he talked to me through this. And then um, I started to realize that my problem lay largely in that really annoying blue circle of overlapping functionality between D3 and Backbone in the sense that they both tries to manage data. And I tr was trying to let both of them manage my data, and I was getting a lot of confusion. And then he just suggested, why don't you just let each of them do what you like them to do? And this, like, you, you like Backbone because you think it does really great data ma management, and you like D3 because it does really great rendering. Just have them do what they're good at. And in retrospect, it's such a simple solution, but um, it gave me such a great clarity um, and I came up with this division of responsibilities, then this new division of responsibilities where um, now Backbone still processes the data, but it passes in the data to um, D3, and the D3 binds the data and renders um, the chart. And Backbone does the same thing to uh, the components. It, it, uh, it, asks, uh, it passes in the data and asks D3 to, uh, to render the components. And when there are changes in the model, it updates, uh, it updates and reprocesses the data and asks for D3 to uh, rebind the data and uh, transition everything. So then the structure starts to look like this. And I really liked uh, what was going on here, which was that the backbone views, instead of being views in the traditional MVC sense, started to act more like the controller. And the backbone model was still the model that passed in uh, the pa that passed data to the view. The view would process the data, and then um, the, that that view would give um, the data to D3, which was now acting acting like the view. And so this is the the result of uh, my very humble like a very humble result of uh, what I was trying to do. Um, you can see that there are the betters on the, on the left and the players on the right. And um, you can tell that the Tony lost this first round and drank a lot. Um, and everybody did not bet on Tony, so then um, they all had to drink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and, then, and then I would hit this button, and then um, it transitions. And this is uh, backbones, you know, all the uh, the backbone model, uh, I'm setting the uh, updated data onto the backbone model, and then the backbone view is reacting and telling D3 to re-render everything. So then you can see that um, Joanne actually bet right this time around, and then um, everybody else had to drink. And then I lost this round, um, drank a lot. Um, and, then, and then everybody had to drink this time around too. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's been a really fun learning process. Um, and um, I, it's, it's, I learned a lot. And there were like a lot of people helping me out along the way. And I like what I've come up with um, at the very end of this all. But 
I also realized that there's a lot of different other approaches and a lot of better approaches also. <laughs> so I'd love to talk to you guys about what you've done, what approaches you've taken, um, where you've gotten stuck, um, what solutions you may have come up with. Um, and I wanted to thank you guys for coming and listening and potentially having this conversation.